All right. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back uh, in the house of the Lord. Uh, it's good to be back with you. Um, I missed you last week, and um, I won't mention any names, but as I was watching on, uh, uh, on YouTube live stream, <clears throat> I could hear some of you singing. Yeah, you heard me say, some of you singing. You know, because the mic doesn't really pick everybody up. But uh, it, was, uh, it was wonderful for me to hear some of you uh, just not overpowering Michael, but singing along with him and um, wishing that I could have been here with you. I am uh, I'm recovering. Bronchitis is, I don't know if I've ever had bronchitis, but um, it's, if, I, if I start getting a, a cough attack, Donna's over here with some, some stuff, because she's a great nurse, uh, and uh, she's got some stuff for me, and I, I, you know what, I'm one of those trusting husbands. She'll bring me pills, and I don't, I don't even ask what they are, I just put them in my mouth, and down they go. I totally trust her. You know, I, I have no idea what they are, in some cases. And, um, but uh, I am thankful to, to be back here. We are completing today, uh, bringing to conclusion, our series on Thanksgiving Psalms. I hope you've enjoyed them. Uh, there are so many other Thanksgiving Psalms, or these are just the four that we were able to highlight and focus on. Um, and at the beginning, I asked you to send me notes on what you're thankful for. And I've wanted to take the responses. I didn't get a lot of responses, but um, of, the, of the responses that I did get, I, I thought um, um, a lot like the early psalmist, you know, who wrote their Thanksgiving songs uh, and poems. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put your... Your, the, the, the response that you gave me, some of you wrote back email, so I want to put them on the screen and I'm going to have you come up here and sing them. How's that sound? Does that sound good? No. No. Okay. Just kidding. But here's a, here's a list of some, some thankful hearts. Uh, Read them, said this year, thankful for cuts, sprains, silly disagreements, Car and household inconveniences. I started reading this. I'm like, I'm not sure where he's going with this. Um, and life's other sundry mishaps. May this always be so. I am thankful my family is whole and thriving this year. That's something to be thankful about in a, in a year when uh, it, everything is in chaos for family to be thriving, so uh, way to go, read them. Uh, and then Silda says, we are blessed with our younger son and his wife expecting a baby in February after six years of trying so hard. They finally have a successful pregnancy this time. Praise the Lord. Something to be thankful for. Phil and Angela said, this year I am most thankful that Angela and I continue to enjoy good health and that at the age, 80, age of 82, and I'm assuming that's Phil's age, not Angela's age, my long-term memory is still intact. He didn't say anything about short-term. <laughs> Andy said, I am thankful for my wife. Good choice, Andy. Start with her. Good choice. Good choice. That Melody and I know God is present in our lives. Boy, that's something to be thankful for. And our church, church family, and church community. Amen. Lisa said, I'm very thankful for God giving me a lot of me time this year. But most importantly, God's continuous blessings for our family. I, I presume that's from uh, um, 
the uh, retirement, all of a sudden have all this time on her hands. And I like it because she's gotten into some, some cooking and she brings stuff for, for us to taste, right? Amen to that. So I'm thankful. Thomas said, I'm thankful for God's protection, provision, and peace for me and my family. He gives us protection from the virus and keeps us healthy. He provides us with our daily bread. Lastly, he provides us peace because we are his children. We are assured he will take care of us into eternity. We are at peace. Boy, what a, what a great thing to be thankful for, to have peace in the midst of a storm even. Carissa said, I am most thankful for my family. You get the, you get the sort of the idea that the Chu family is, uh, the Chu family is a true family. How's that sound? Okay. Uh, I am most thankful for my family. I always thank my parents for providing me with a roof over my head and food on the table. I thank my older sister, Crystal, for cooking for me every time I go over to her apartment. I would say that's something to be thankful for. I don't know how I got lucky with the best family in the world, but it's all thanks to the glory of God. She's also thankful and grateful for our church that preaches and teaches the truth. And then Chris, finally, he says, I am thankful for Crystal. Good choice, once again. Chris, starting with her. And my family and friends, my dogs, and time on this earth. Praise God that God has given all of us time on this earth. What for? Why did God give us time on this earth? To do as we please or to glorify Him? So, on the spur of the moment, uh, most of us can uh, recount, we can come up with a half a dozen things we're thankful for. If someone walked up to you and put a microphone in your face and said, give us five things or six things you're thankful for, you could probably rattle off that many at least. Some may seem superficial, but every good thing God grants us is a reason to be thankful. But the blessings that you find in deep waters, when God rescued you from a certain death, or those are far more precious than the blessing of just finding a perfect seashell on the beach. The deep water stuff are what songs are written about. The psalm that we are going to look at today seems to have been written by David after the Lord rescued him from a certain demise. His heart is thankful for what God did and is doing, hence the title of today's message, Thankful Hearts. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 138. Now, a couple of weeks ago we had... 43 verses in the psalm. Before that, I think we had five verses. And I think Dal did, and I thank uh, the Lord for Pastor Chen, who uh, spoke uh, last week, did a fantastic job. And I always appreciate uh, the message that God gives him. I think he focused on six verses. And today, we're going to be looking at eight verses. Um, now, this psalm is uh, attributed to David, but nowhere does it appear, uh, or are, they, are there any clues or evidence as to the occasion for David writing it? We can conclude that David had faced some uh, insurmountable obstacle, and he called out to the Lord. Uh, we know that from Scripture that David encountered many lows in his life, many difficulties in his life. 
Some were even self-inflicted. We all had those moments in our past as well. Maybe not to the degree that David did, but moments we found ourselves in deep waters with no possibility of rescue but for God. Have you had moments like that in your past? In your darkest hour of need, God came to the rescue. Do you carry those memories, those moments with you? You should. You should carry those moments with you just as David did. Now, in this psalm, we see first that David looks back with thankfulness on the experiences he had of God's goodness to him. Let's look at it, verse 1. Note the personal references through the first three verses. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted uh, above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increase. Uh, this is not a David as king recalling Yahweh's deliverance of God's people. And David is proclaiming this uh, as the head, as the king, as the leader of a people. This is personal. As I say, we, we don't know what the occasion was that David's re recounting. We don't know. Could be uh, any number of them, any number of things. But there's no ambiguity that God was the one who delivered him, delivered him personally. Do you know what one of the problems that we face as American Christians? We have some problems. We have some obstacles that are unique to, I think, America, uh, unique to Western society. Uh, and that is that we have so many safety nets in place. We have personal safety nets, corporate safety nets, local, state, and federal government safety nets, agencies that we could fall back on. Especially today with so many programs in place, it's better for a lot of people not to work. I think that's one of the most amazing things. There's all these jobs, and, but people stay home uh, because it's, it's more profitable for them because of all the handouts, all the, the agencies, and all the, the money that is available. So we lack the need for God to rescue us because if our personal savings can't rescue us, insurance will rescue us. And if insurance can't rescue us, then government will. Now, I'm not advocating for all of us to dump our insurance policies and train our savings, but I do think that for Christians who live in a world where faith is not a daily necessity, or at least we don't always think so, we must constantly weigh our position of faith. Am I trusting the Lord or am I trusting in my own security? Let me ask it this way. If all you have, all your possessions, everything that you have right now, if it was gone, what would your faith look like? Would it be the same? Would it increase? Or would it decrease? Your security cannot be the basis for your faith. 
but it should be reflective of your faith. Let me repeat that. Your security cannot be the basis of your faith. If you're putting all your faith in your security in your bank accounts and your possessions and your positions, then you are building your house on the wrong foundation. Instead, it should be reflective of your faith. What do you do with your security? What do you do with your bank account, with your savings account? Why do you have those? It should be reflective of your faith. David was the king of Israel, very successful king. Defeated all the surrounding nations and led the Israelites into a prosperous several decades. But his security was not in his position. His security was in Yahweh. Now, the literal translation, uh, in if, if, you, if you took the, the Hebrew words and, and you, you just t- took it word for word, translation of verse 3, it would read like this. In that day, when I cried out, you answered me, and made me whole, made me bold in my soul with strength. You know, a lot of us, we read that and we go, well, where's the deliverance? Where's the rescue? Usually when you think of rescue, you're in, in a deep water somewhere and you're about to drown and, and then you see this Coast Guard helicopter come, they drop somebody in the water, they tie this cable around you, uh, and then they hoist you up, and then you're rescued. They, they pull you out of the problem. And sometimes God does that. But you can't forget the fact that oftentimes God doesn't take us out of the problem. He doesn't rescue us. He doesn't always deliver us out of the problem, but He does deliver us in the sense that He gives us strength to endure it. And that's what David is recounting here. That day, it says, he remembered the day like it was yesterday. Do you remember the day when God rescued you? When God came alongside of you? When God showed himself to you? And and you knew that you were going to be okay because he is with you. The word soul means it just simply means a living being, okay? So it means all of your life. It could even be translated uh, as uh, emotion or passion or, or desire. And so you can see that it encompasses the whole of a person. We want God to deliver us physically, but then we want, want us to leave Him alone. Uh, we want us... We want Him to leave us alone. A little dyslexic there, sorry. But we we want God to deliver us, but then we want the rest of our lives, we want want Him to just leave leave us to do our own thing. As though God is some kind of genie that grants wishes. So now we come to verse 4. It switches from this personal, uh, personal day when God made him uh, bold. So recounting that to a general declaration that others should turn to Yahweh. Let's look at it, verse 4. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing the ways of the Lord. For great is the Lord, uh, great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the low, uh, lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Here you see that the purpose of adversity is twofold. When you go through difficult times, there's a twofold purpose for why you go through it. God allows us to go through trials. He allows us 
to go through testing. And it's two, twofold. Number one, to mature us. To make us more mature. And then number two, so that we can proclaim His glory. If you look at James chapter 1, verse 2 and following, and I like the uh, uh, NIV translation of this. And I, I like to say at this point, I like the 1984 NIV translation of this. Uh, the further, the later translations of the NIV um, have opted to uh, use a gender-neutral or uh, gender-inclusive language. Um, and I understand why they are doing that, and, and, you know. But I think that if we are going to translate Scripture... It ought, to, it ought to be translated in the way that it was written and not, not to change it to make a few people feel better. Because if you start with that, and, and then there'll be other things, and then pretty soon you'll have a Bible that doesn't really mean what it, what it says. And so let me encourage you, if you are of uh, the NIV persuasion, to make sure you have the right version of the NIV. Um, and I think the 2011 NIV and on um, is, is probably a, not a good translation for us to follow. But it says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything. James is writing to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, being driven out of their own city, their own country, their, their own land, and being persecuted. And James is telling them that that testing of their faith is going to produce Perseverance and perseverance has a work that it must do. And, and, and when, when perseverance works itself out in your life, in my life, it is what makes us mature and complete, not lacking anything. That has to come first. The goal is maturity. God wants you to mature in your trials. You have to. Because if you don't, you can't carry out the next part. If you don't mature, then you can't give glory to God. If you don't pass the test, you, can't, you don't get to proclaim how good God is. I mean, what are you going to say? <coughs> Excuse me. It didn't work for me, but you might want to give it a try. Is that what you're going to say? The reason David can say in verse 4, all the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, is because he personally has experienced Yahweh's goodness. David called on God, and God answered. And his conclusion is, everyone should call on the name of the Lord. Have you gone through some difficulty in the past? I think we could all raise our hands to some degree or another. We've, we've gone through some difficulty. There are very few people I meet in this world who say, you know what, my life has just been a bed of roses all my life. I've never had any problem. And to them I say, well, it seems like God is just waiting to let you have it all on the back end. Are you going through something right now? But whether you have or you are, there is something God wants you to do with all that heartache, with all that pain and suffering. There's something that God 
wants you to do. He wants you to call on Him. So He can answer you and make you bold in your soul with strength. If it's to deliver you and to pluck you out of the problem, praise God. But it's to give you boldness so that, and strength so that you can endure that problem, then praise God. But there's something that He wants you to do. He wants you to call on Him, and He wants to embolden you so you can endure it and mature through it. And He wants you to do that so you can tell others about His goodness. Now notice what David says as he brings this particular psalm to a close. Verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. You read that and you go, where is David now? Where is he now? He's right in the middle of yet another problem, is he not? I walk, though I walk, that's present tense, In the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. As I said, David, his life was just from one problem to another. Some brought on by his enemies because he stood for the Lord, and some self-inflicted, but it was one problem after another. What's his response? Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt? Notice that he's back to the personal. He doesn't say you delivered us or we walked through them. He's back to I and my. What a wonderful thing, isn't it? But I mean, the, this collective church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, is a wonderful thing to belong to the church. But when it's all said and done, it is a personal an intimate relationship with God Almighty through His Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 8 says, The Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. Don't just read over that and, and and go on to the next verse. When you think about that, that David had a divine purpose for his life. Your the Lord will fulfill His purpose for me. And if David had a divine purpose, you have a divine purpose. Because you too are created in the image of God. You have a divine purpose for God to fulfill in you. Don't just gloss over that. Get alone with the Lord. If you don't know what your purpose is, get alone with the Lord. Let me tell you the beauty of that. Is as I as I look out and I and I, I contemplate everyone who's watching my live stream. And I, I see your faces and I think, you know, some of us, some of you are young and you got like your whole life ahead of you. And others of us, uh, there, there, is, there is more behind us than, than there is in front of us. And we, we get that. We recognize that. Okay? If I, if I live, uh, if I'm halfway through right now, then I would have to be 124 years old when I, when I leave this earth. You know, I don't want to stay around that long. I promise you. So I, I, we, we know that, that for some of us, there's not a whole lot of time, life, years left. And you, you 
look back and you go, man, I have wasted so much. Wasted so much. But the beauty of God and His purpose is it starts now. You don't have to look back and say, I've wasted all that. It's like, well, you did or you didn't. But the point is that you get you get to fulfill God's purpose for you starting today. That's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And then he concludes with this. He says, do not forsake the work of your hands. Now, when I read that, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, David. You, it sounds like you're saying, God, don't quit on me. Doesn't it? Sounds like that. What is he saying? Don't quit on me? I, I think that would be the, the wrong interpretation. Instead, what he is saying to the Lord is, don't stop, Lord, because I'm all in. Now, many of you know I'm a, I'm a <clears throat> NASCAR fan, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I love NASCAR. I love driving on the track. I love riding on the track. And um, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I know that, that these different tracks all around the country, there are these, it's called a NASCAR experience where you can pay lots of money and you can sit in the passenger, they put a seat on the passenger side and they put a professional driver in there and they go 150, 180 miles an hour on those tracks. Okay? And, uh, I know that probably some of you, you'd be terrified you get in there and like, get me out of this, okay? And you'd be praying that famous prayer, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll go to church every Sunday, you know? One of those prayers, right? And there are others of us who get in there, it's like, go faster. Can this thing go any faster, right? And that's kind of what David is saying. He's not saying, don't forsake the work of your hands in the sense that, you know, don't, don't, don't call it quits. Don't end it early. Don't quit on me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, don't take your foot off the gas because I'm all in. That's what he's saying. I'm all in. If you want to give me more trouble, I'm all in because I have found you to be faithful through any trouble that I have faced. If you want to give me peace, I'll take it. If you want to give me more enemies, I'll take it. Because you're the one that defeats all my enemies. Don't take your foot off the gas, Lord. Because I'm all in. I've experienced your faithfulness in the past. I've told others that they need to do the same thing. And I find you to be faithful in keeping your promises in the midst of my current troubles. I'm all in, Lord. Don't take your foot off the gas. I wonder how many of us are willing to say that? Are you in that car, in that passenger seat, and God's driving, and you're like, Lord, I can't take any more of this. Let me out. Or do you trust God enough? Say, Lord, keep it coming. I'm all in. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this psalm that, that David wrote that just really encourages us, especially especially, Lord, for those of us who are in the midst of a storm. That there are some in, in our midst that, uh, that face insurmountable trouble. Deep waters. But I thank you, Lord, that you are with each and every person. 
that you don't leave them, you don't forsake them. And that you have a plan and a purpose. For every struggle, every, every problem, every trial that we face, you have a purpose. That you want us to persevere and to endure it and, and so that we can be made more mature and complete and then that, so that we are able to, to proclaim your goodness to this world. Lord, I, I just lift up each person who is facing insurmountable difficulties right now. Lord, that you give them the, that in, in their soul, that you would strengthen their soul. You would embolden them to endure it. To say, okay, Lord, don't take your foot off the gas. I'm all in. I pray, Lord, that you give them that courage and that, that strength to endure it just as David did. And that days from now and years from now, they'll be able to look back and recount how faithful you were and how you blessed them and how you delivered them, how you allowed them to endure what they're facing right now. And that they'll be able to proclaim that truth and that their neighbors and their family members and their coworkers and anybody and everybody they come in contact would hear that story and would be blessed and, and would want to bow down to you as well and to call you their God, their Deliverer. And that many, many more people would come to faith in Christ as a result of the trials that we face today. We thank you, Lord, that you give us this opportunity. That trials are opportunities to endure so that we can proclaim your goodness. Don't take your foot off the gas, Lord. I'm all in. In Jesus' name. Amen.